good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you could be in the four corners of the world. I wish to welcome you to module two of our course, Post-COVID-19 Low Carbon Transition. Module two is going to be focusing on disaster risk reduction under climate change and pandemics. You need to note that we don't say under COVID-19, but we are considering all other pandemics, past, current, and future pandemics. So I'm, uh, again, uh, Professor Godwell Namo will be making this recording, and I hope you will find it beneficial uh, to you. Uh, and you should actually consider this recording uh, with other uh, resources we have uh, planned or we have developed for you. This includes a PowerPoint that will be uploaded or that is uploaded on our platform and also module notes that we have prepared for you. And in these modules, like we said, there are activities that will assist you uh, in enhancing your understanding and knowledge in terms of the perspectives we'll be covering in this module. In terms of our module outline, we will start by the module learning outcomes, then I'll go to module objectives and topics. Then I'm going to focus on COVID-19, origins, impact, and contestations thereof. I'll move on to the section dealing with the resource mobilization to fight COVID-19, and also focus a bit on challenges for Africa and lessons for climate change. I will also consider a section on the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction and also the elevation of climate change into this framework. Then I will focus uh, on another section looking at the party agreement, looking at NDCs and links to low carbon uh, transition agenda. Then our last section will be on extreme weather and climate related events in Africa and how these relate or impact on low carbon transition. And as usual, there will be a module quiz that you need to complete on your own. You will have that option again for 10 questions with up to three attempts uh, for you to maybe get the certificate of competence from IDEP. Now, as to our learning outcomes, by the end of this module, you as a participant, you should be able to check the development geopolitics of COVID-19 and articulate some of the impacts of COVID-19. You should also be able to articulate COVID-19 as a disaster within the Sendai framework, and you should be able to articulate the funding and associated challenges for funding COVID-19 and draw lessons for funding climate change post COVID-19. You should be able to have the basic understanding of the core principles of the Sendai framework and how this relates to the low carbon transition you should also have a holistic understanding of the Paris Agreement, which is a central pillar in terms of low carbon transition on the continent. And you must also identify some key weather extremes in Africa and how such link to low carbon transition. In terms of our objectives, there are three that we have said in this module. The first one, to establish the context surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and build knowledge regarding the linkages between COVID-19 and climate change in terms of knowledge and resource mobilization. Objective number two, we're looking at, to, looking at understanding the evolution from the Hugo uh, framework on disaster management to the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. And our objective number three is to learn more on the Paris Agreement and highlight linkages with the law carbon transition. The topics, um, they are as follows, COVID-19 origins, impact and contestations thereof. Uh, topic number two, resource mobilization to fight uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And topic number three, fundamentals within the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. Then topic four, the Paris Agreement with a focus on NDCs and links to the low carbon agenda. I think it's important for me to highlight the NDCs nationally determined contributions because these actually are the instruments upon which the net zero is being built. Then lastly, dealing with extreme weather and climate related events 
And of course, this includes cyclones, tornadoes, and floods. Let me move to COVID-19 origins, impact, and contestations thereof. As usual, we have quite a nice activity that we're going to be embarking on. Just before you start maybe reading through your PowerPoints or even uh, progressing with uh, uh, listening to this recording. So it means you can go to your PowerPoint uh, that is loaded on the platform. Then you get to this activity at this point in time. The activity basically is as follows. Uh, as it is critical to understand the broader dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of infections, death, etc., please visit the John Hopkins University website with the COVID pandemic uh, a mapping or map I will have provided the website there. And I need you then to post your responses in your group platform, uh, discussion platform. So here are some of the uh, 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 issues that we want you to post on the group platform. Number one, we want you to report the total uh, global cases on COVID-19 infection. So the one, first one there is infection, COVID-19 death, and COVID-19 vaccine doses administered. You will find it there in that platform. This is a global total. Number two, we want, we want you to list the top five countries in terms of infections. And number three, we want you to list the top five African countries in terms of infections. And lastly, the, we want you to identify your own country and report the total cases of COVID-19 infection, the death, and also vaccine doses administered. This is going to give us a very good and quick understanding in terms of what is taking place uh, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic globally, regionally, continentally, and also at a national level. Now, part of the background, the increase in uh, disease in, uh, and impact on climate change has been one of the major global concerns. As a number of diseases and pandemics has been on the rise in the past, and of course, such occurrences uh, cause loss of lives and also livelihoods then there's need for us to understand these uh, global threats um, that are critical in terms of formulating our global responses. There are also fears of continued repeat of diseases, extreme weather and pandemics or epidemics. And of course, this uh, we cannot over, um, uh, overemphasize uh, in terms of uh, the fact that Africa as a continent also needs to be responding to these pandemics, epidemics, and diseases. Now, uh, just a global picture. In your PowerPoint, you see we have presented a global picture there uh, in terms of uh, uh, the pandemics that have been experienced in the, in the past. Uh, it's, a, it's a global hotspot or map on, on, on diseases and pandemics. We include yellow fever, we include dengue fever, Zika, we include the uh, diarrhea outbreaks, we include MERS, uh, we include SARS, or all these pandemics and diseases that have Ebola, we, we map there. Then I think it would be interesting for you to just have a look and see that this is not the first and last pandemic we are going to be experiencing. Now, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, uh, also known as uh, SARS-2, or also known as uh, coronavirus disease of 2019, uh, abbreviated COVID-19, is known to have originate, uh, originated in China uh, sometime in December in Huang, in, uh, in Huang, Hubei uh, province. And of course, uh, China notified the World Health Organization, abbreviated WMO, uh, I think on the 31st of December, if my memory serves me well, that there is this novel coronavirus that uh, is uh, an outbreak of this no uh, novel coronavirus at a market, uh, the animals market in, in, in Wuhan. Now, according to the WMO, a pandemic involves a worldwide spread of a new disease. Uh, a new disease. So what, what, is, what, what is happening there is um, for it to be a pandemic, it should have so we move from a simple disease to an epidemic and to a pandemic. Now, a pandemic would have then covered uh, the whole world. So it, it should have touched all the continents. Uh, and of course, then that uh, makes it 
uh, uh, to be determined as a pandemic. And what is interesting here is by the 11th of March, 2020, this is when the WHO declared uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic. So this is the time when it reached every continent. And of course, then that triggers massive uh, global action in terms of how then do we deal with, uh, with this uh, uh, pandemic uh, moving forward. Now, what is happening there is there has been a lot of conspiracies, uh, contestations in terms of how did the disease come uh, about? Was it a laboratory leak uh, from Wuhan uh, or was it a natural uh, transmission from, 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 from the market? And of course, the coronavirus is usually associated with pangolins and bats. So, but we, what we know definitely in terms of, of these contestations, there has been a, a huge tension uh, China and the USA. And I remember former President uh, Donald Trump uh, at one stage or maybe consistently referred to uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus as the Chinese, Chinese, virus, uh, Chinese virus. And of course, uh, that did not uh, stand uh, well with China, and rightly so because uh, it, it, it becomes a, a real problem. And this is also the reason why as the United Nations, as the WHO names these pandemics, they have to then bring a neutral name. It's something that we've also seen with even the variants of the, of the, of, of, of the coronavirus. So remember we were talking about the, the South African variant, the Indian variant, the uh, Brazilian variant, but then uh, the uh, WHO then said, no, we don't have to go with the source of that particular variant or even the source of the uh, COVID-19, but we use the neutral names. And I'm sure you are uh, now hearing of alpha, beta in terms of these uh, variants. So basically it's, it's, a, it's a global norm in terms of removing stigmatization. And we, we have read maybe in the media or maybe seen uh, some instances where the Chinese were being targeted uh, for, for, for people that have caused the world to be in, in turmoil. So this is actually why, why we, we name these variants and also the pandemics with neutral names that do not actually uh, give us a history of the source because it's not necessary for us. Yes, it's necessary in terms of could be other uh, prevention measures, but then in the long term, it's not beneficial to name these viruses with such kind of derogatory or in, uh, names that imply that you are the cause of this problem. So that need to be understood well. So of course, uh, the World Health Organization uh, did the investigations and they were inconclusive to say, definitely this, there's no evidence that the, the virus was a leak from a, from a Chinese lab in Wuhan. And of course, there's now uh, an ongoing contestation in terms of that. Now, uh, what is interesting as well is this, um, uh, the, the fight between uh, US and, and China and possibly US and those that support China resulted in an unpleasant situation where uh, the US under President Trump were there to withdraw completely uh, their funding from the WHO and it runs into about millions, about 400 million, 450 to 500 million annually, if I'm not mistaken, support that was being given to the WHO. And that definitely uh, did not stand uh, all well with uh, the WHO and also in other global players. And of course, we are happy uh, after the Biden administration, they actually recommitted to say they will be financing uh, the WHO as per their. Uh, old, uh, old uh, pledges. And of course, as well, there has been this challenge where the US, uh, number one, they did not even ratify the Kyoto Protocol. They also did not ratify the Paris. Uh, actually, they pulled out of the Paris Agreement. This is quite interesting. So President Obama ratified the Paris Agreement. Uh, President Trump uh, came in and withdrew from the Paris Agreement. President Biden came in and he has now taken steps towards rejoining the Paris Agreement, which is a right thing uh, to do, especially with this agenda that is also aligning to this net zero by 2050. Now, 
Um, I've uh, slotted in the uh, map uh, that we also uh, uh, see when we do that activity uh, on the John Hopkins, and you will see some of the figures that I was talking about there, you, you would see them. So as of 14 September, we are uh, uh, maybe a week or so from 14 September, uh, you discover that uh, in total, uh, a number of cases globally, there were about 225 million cases. Uh, then in terms of death, we had just passed 4,642 uh, 4, deaths. So because these are death, we, we, we are bringing them to the last number uh, of estimate. 4,643,152 uh, people have lost their lives due to the pandemic. And of course, you know, there's a lot of underreporting in some countries where the systems are not that effective. So this number definitely is bigger than the one that has been reported now. Then, of course, there were also numbers in terms of vaccines uh, uh, administered. And of course, uh, the good thing is like we had just passed 5.7 billion of vaccines uh, administered uh, globally, which is a very good thing. And of course, uh, uh, this is a good number, but remember most of the vaccines there, apart from the Johnson & Johnson jab, they are all uh, two vaccines. So roughly, uh, it's, it's, it's not about, it's not 5.7 billion people, but it's about 5.7 billion administered jabs. Now, there's also an interesting take there that comes when you are talking about COVID-19 pandemic and how it impacts or relates to the SDGs. So the very first thing that we discovered is there has been a lot of money that went into SDG 3. SDG 3 is the one that talk about health and well-being. We have seen billions being channeled towards addressing the pandemic. But also we have seen a lot that has happened, a bit of a smile towards the environment there, a reduction in carbon emissions. Remember, at some point the world came to almost a standstill. It was a complete, almost a total shutdown in terms of travel, air travel, land travel, uh, sea travel, maritime, all those things almost a standstill in terms of travel and that reduced uh, carbon emissions. But the interesting part is it did not have the dent that is needed. So regardless of the pandemic where there was a temporal reduction in emissions, the emissions continued uh, to grow. And of course, they will continue picking if we don't do anything. What are the issues were interesting? We see budgets being shifted. So for example, there were issues around you have to move budgets. A lot of um, uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions required that we buy PPEs, protect, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, gloves, we buy gloves, we buy um, ventilators, we buy masks, we, we buy sanitizers. So our governments actually mobilized a lot of money or resources towards those non-pharmaceutical uh, 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 interventions. And uh, water, the water sector, SDG 6, was one that really was on the spotlight because we need these things, even the energy issue, they were also on the spotlight. You would need that decent work, it was impacted heavily. Why SDG 8? Because people lost their jobs. It, it, it was a mega loss in terms of employment. And the hotel industry specifically has been tended and many other industries were also affected by uh, COVID-19. What about cities? We have seen the highlight of uh, the, 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 the the informal settlement. Some they they call them slum uh, slum uh, areas where we are saying because of all these requirements where we need water, reticulated water systems, uh, good sanitation systems. It has been uh, the informal settlements have been what spots and as such. COVID-19 have just magnified, it spotlighted the informal settlement and challenged governments to say, we need to do something about the informal uh, settlements. Peace and security, there have been disturbances in terms of peace and security. Uh, also linking that to gender, gender-based violence, 
imagine people being locked. Uh, I think in South Africa now we are counting almost close to two years um, of lockdown at various levels and many other places in the world. And the cases of domestic uh, violence have been reported to have been on the rise. So all these are also some of the uh, impacts that the uh, pandemic uh, has brought, which have got a bearing in terms of the low carbon transition. Why I'm saying so, a lot of resources, some of which could have been channeled towards uh, addressing the low carbon transition, has been gobbled, has been taken up by the desire to fight the, the pandemic. And you see, as part of this, you know, the politicians at the times who are the, the, the people who appropriate our budgets uh, when the votes are being read in our parliaments or in our, in our Senate, uh, they, they, they are more interested in the short term. So as the pandemic is happening and the election is coming next week or next year, then the resources must go there so that people can see that the politicians, our governments are doing something. And we would see uh, money uh, flowing that direction compared to climate change, which has been, as, as, which results in most of the time slow onsets. And of course, because we've been talking about this climate change since, and, and uh, nothing seemed to be happening. So we discover it's not that easy for us to channel resources uh, into that. But what I'm saying there, we have learned from the pandemic that indeed where there is a will, there is a way. If the government really wants to, to mobilize, if the world wants to mobilize resources to address a problem, it can do that. So I think this is one of the biggest lessons or the bigger lesson that we've learned uh, from, the, from, from the pandemic. It, indeed, where there is a will for financial mobilization, that can be done. Education, we don't talk about education. We have seen children going online, those that are fortunate, but it is also spotlighted the issue of um, uh, inequality in education, the gaps between the haves and have nots. People, uh, uh, the, 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 the schools that are resourced quickly went online and these children did not miss as much even on during the hard lockdown. But those schools that did not have online, rural schools across Africa, across the continent, some have already dropped out of school permanently. And I'm saying them, the government need to be watching this space carefully. And as we have got some of our participants being in government, this is an issue that we really need to look after. And of course, there are long-term impacts that are going to come. We have had orphans left, uh, uh, left by, 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 by the pandemic, left, right, and center. And the government need to look into this to say, what systems then do we need to put in place to make sure that some of these young ones that have been unfortunate to lose their parents uh, uh, continue uh, with a livelihood, continue with an education. The government also need to, uh, to prioritize that and in documenting uh, the offense that, uh, that have resulted from the pandemic. And as we are seeing that in terms of SDG 17, there's been a lot of collaboration and partnerships from I know from South Africa, uh, we have written one of the books that we published uh, last year that you know there there was this um, you know, coming together to mobilize financial resources and other resources. I remember one that touched me Ubuntu beds where they were saying that the people in the medical fraternity they should actually be accommodated there and assist uh, the government because a lot of hotels were empty. But then at times when people are uh, are infected by, by the coronavirus, they don't have anywhere to stay. Why don't we then use some of those hotels as quarantine sites and, uh, and help uh, save lives? And that has happened in many countries. So there are a lot of things that um, uh, COVID-19 have taught us to collaborate, to cooperate. And of course, that is what uh, is needed. I will not go through each and every objectives, like I'm saying, but I want to end there by just casting our eye on the blue economy, which is SDG 14 or ocean economy. That whole field was impacted also severely by COVID. We have heard of, um, of, of ferries, we have heard of, of, of um, the, the, uh, the ships that were stranded uh, at sea. So the cruise, the cruise liners that were stranded at sea, some people dying even in those cruise liners. And at some point when the world closed completely their borders and there were, there, there were no cruise, 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 uh, cruise liners 
operating. And up to today, some of them are still trying to recover. So you can imagine that we have a world that is actually full of these challenges from the pandemic, not only environmental, but social, economic, and political. And the way Africa is going to handle this pandemic is going to be very necessary. We've also seen other issues that we've written about around uh, the, the um, uh, vaccine nationalism. You can uh, download that uh, paper that I, I, I did uh, with some other authors. It's uh, online, free of charge. And just read how the vaccine nationalism issue played uh, out in terms of the of the pandemic. So in as much as we want to recover as a continent, we are not seeing adequate supply in terms of the vaccine. Then we we'll thank President Ramaphosa and the Indian president uh, who have uh, put a lot of pressure uh, on global leaders to say, we need to have a relook in terms of intellectual property rights and the manner in which we address the manufacturing of vaccines, not only manufacturing, even the supply system of vaccines uh, complete or even packaging material and other raw materials. I remember there was another row between India and USA when USA was closing up, exporting the raw materials that were needed for manufacturing some of the vaccines. There. These are some of the issues that the pandemic has taught us. And as we move towards low carbon transition on the continent, we are wiser. And now just a, um, doing a rundown in terms of some of the issues that we expect uh, we experienced from the uh, uh, pandemic lockdowns. Um, there were a lot of the world actually, as I explained earlier on, almost came to a stand too in, ter in terms of uh, lockdowns. But what is interesting is so uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, we have shown a map in your uh, PowerPoint slides. You can see it later. Where we, uh, I, 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 we are tracing the, the repo rate cuts as of 24 May, this at the peak of the pandemic. So you've seen the governments cutting the interest rates uh, to have relief uh, to their citizens and companies. And some went to as high as 225 basis points. Um, and some even cut these reports three times. So the interesting part is like, we see the, the willingness of governments to even cut reports three times in, what, in less than six months to make sure that resources are made available to, to, uh, to the citizens to address the pandemic. And they're saying that can also be done in terms of uh, trying to raise funds to address climate change and also move towards our net zero by 2050 targets. So in terms of funding there for COVID, a lot of um, uh, funding uh, was accessible uh, uh, through tax regimes and also other tax mechanisms. And these are some of the uh, additional uh, uh, um, uh, issues that were coming. So there were debt plan payments, suspending debt, uh, deferral of payments, extensions of deadlines, quick funds to taxpayers, temporal uh, changes in audit policy. All these things uh, 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 were done to assist. And of course, there were also funds that were raised to assist the citizens. I know in South Africa, there, there was a benefit for those that have lost employment in the US, the same, and I think many other countries did the, uh, did the same. So when you go through the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint, you see there are nice graphs that are set in there, uh, showing us the impact of the pandemic uh, uh, for tourism, uh, restaurants, um, uh, uh, sporting events. Uh, and and also even a pilgrimage. You could actually um, uh, see this and read further on your own. And this concludes our recording in terms of uh, that topic on COVID-19. I will now um, transit to cover our topic, the Sendai framework and the elevation of climate change as a disaster. Now, as usual, there's an activity there. Just uh, less than four minutes, we have picked a um, a, a YouTube video that would be of interest to you. He's talking about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, just three minutes, 37 seconds. And uh, you would um, be happy to go through that uh, video on your own and be informed in terms of what I'm going to talk about right now. Now, we cannot talk about the Sendai framework without talking about the Yugo framework for action, which was running 2005 to 2015. And uh, the subtopic there was building the resilience of nations and communities to disasters. Uh, 
So you, 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 from 2005, this was the framework for disasters that was guiding us to 2015. So what was interesting there uh, is um, it was adopted by 168 governments uh, at the World Conference on Disaster Reduction that was held uh, in uh, Kobe, a year ago in Japan. Uh, uh, between uh, uh, 18 to 22 January 2005. Now, that uh, framework identifies separate priorities for action. The first one is to ensure that disasters, uh, that disaster risk reduction is a national and local priority with a strong institutional bias for implementation. The second priority area was to identify, as, uh, assess, and monitor disaster risks and enhance early warning. I think the question of early warning makes uh, much sense now because the world over, we have seen the importance of early warning and we cannot separate early warning, uh, number one, from even the pandemic that we're talking about and also from the current um, uh, crisis of climate change that we're having and also the extreme weather events that are related to climate change that we've been experiencing, droughts, floods, tornadoes, cyclones, extreme winds, extreme frost, uh, wildfires, all those we the disasters that require early warning. Then also a, a priority to use knowledge, innovation, and education to build a culture of safety and resilience at all levels. Another point, number four, to reduce underlying risk factors. And lastly, to strengthen disaster preparedness for effective a response at all levels. So as we are talking about disasters, we usually talk about this issue of disaster reduction or management cycle, where we talk about you have to prepare. When you prepare, then you remember a disaster will strike. There is immediately what we call search and rescue. And after search and rescue, we go to a, a relief where we are now bringing the food and everything. Then from there, we go to reconstruction a redevelopment. And then that's actually how we should manage uh, our disasters. Now, then the uh, after the book of framework, then uh, by 2014, the, um, the negotiations towards a new framework uh, uh, were concluded. And this resulted in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction there with a period 2015 to 2030. And of course, Sendai is a city in Japan. So what we discovered there, there in the Sendai framework, uh, the structure of the entire document, we have got uh, the expected uh, outcome and goal. Then we've got guiding principles. Then we've got uh, uh, four priority uh, uh, priorities for action. So priority one is we need to understand the disaster risk. That is critical, of which climate change is one of the disasters that have been now mainstreamed into Sendai framework. You discover in the olden generation, in the Yugo framework, climate change was not mainstream there because it was really not considered as part of these common disasters, which included health and others. Then priority two is strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. Priority three looks at investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience. And lastly, priority four looks at enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and to build back better in recovery rehabilitation and reconstruction. So you wonder where this concept of building back better is coming from. It is coming from the Sendai framework as if you did not know, or if you did not know, now you know. It is a priority area. We need to build back better. But we have written in one of our recent books when we are considering cyclone, uh, impact of cyclone in I and Kenneth in Southern Africa, that we don't only need to build back better. We need to build and build back better. So if added another B, the, the quadruple B. So we need to build better now. Then if there's a disaster, we need to build back better. But there's also another interesting uh, concept that have come now, which is building forward better. So this is quite interesting. So they're saying now we need to be forward looking. So in terms, in terms of this, instead of building back better, we need to build forward better. But for me, I want to say, we need to build to build back and build forward better. So when you say build back and build forward back better, then that uh, 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 incorporates uh, the, uh, the elements. Better still, you can add that other additional B to say we need to build, build back and build 
forward better. So really, these are all the jargons that you're going to learn. But I think I want to leave you with the last one. When you are building now, we need to build better. When there's a distraction, we need to build back better. Before the distraction, we need to build forward. So really, these are all uh, issues that are interesting when I'm talking about the low carbon uh, uh, transition in Africa. Now, so uh, that uh, gives us uh, the, 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 um, the, the concept and how the Sendai uh, framework is aligned. But the major, the major, major aspect there in the Sendai framework is this idea of building back better, those priority areas, and also the idea of biological disasters is integrated there, and also the issue of um, uh, what we call the uh, climate change is also integrated in there. That concludes us uh, in the terms of the highlights of the Sendai framework. I'm going to move to the section looking at the Paris Agreement. As usual, there's an activity there. Uh, we don't give you uh, 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 long activities. This is just a, a two minute, actually it's a 1.39 minute video clip, which is going to talk about what is the Paris Agreement and how does it work. So you can watch that uh, 1.3 nine minute uh, video and, and enjoy. So the Paris Agreement basically in summary, it is um, it has got a goal, global goal to build resilience. Then it also has got a global goal to phase out greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. So we want to up our global resilience and we want to, uh, to lower our greenhouse gas emissions. If we can understand this, then it's gonna be very interesting when we deal with the Paris Agreement. So now, uh, building global resilience is all about adaptation. Uh, narrowing or, or, or reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero is mitigation. And of course, there is support there, which is building capacity. Uh, we also have the global green finance. We've got uh, finance strategy, or technology transfer and cooperation. And all this is done in a manner that is transparent and that also uh, requires accountability. Furthermore, you, you, you discover there are a number of other articles that are there in the Paris Agreement. So we have got what is the, the science basis for undertaking this. We also have got uh, matters around carbon markets. Uh, we have got issues around uh, loss and damage from the Warsaw. Then we've got issues around finding, issues around uh, technology development and transfer, issues around capacity building. Also is around education, training and awareness. And of course, there's one other element that is very critical in terms of the Paris Agreement, which is the global stock tech. Now, in the Paris Agreement, which was basically, um, which ended into force on, on 4th November 2016, uh, after 73 countries and the European Union joined the agreement and exceeding 55% of the threat of, uh, threshold of emissions. And of course, as of um, uh, uh, 24 February 2017, uh, just uh, six months down the line, 136 countries had already ratified the Paris Agreement out of the 197 parties to the convention. Now, this was massive. So whereas we had a challenge with the uh, ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, uh, we did not have any challenge with the ratification of the Paris Agreement because, like I said, that 2007 report had put things into perspective, the I I IPCC report, to say, you know what, we need to wake up. Now, there's also another issue that is coming in Paris Agreement, which is the indices. Now, the, the nationally determined contributions, what they do, they are trying to address the provision in the Paris Agreement to lower the greenhouse gas emissions. And then this, 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 this are the indices express a national commitment to say, ah, for us as Nigeria, for us as Togo, uh, for us as Mali, for us as Rwanda, Burundi, for us as Tanzania, for us as Malawi, for us as Namibia, Lesotho, Eswatini. This is what we are putting on the table in terms of a pathway to reduce uh, the carbon emissions. The major debate has been window dressing. So some of the countries really, they did not try to, to, to stretch their boundaries. They wanted it simple. So literally what they committed there was way below what is expected. And now the mechanism to trace if the countries are doing well is through that uh, stock tech. 
uh, a mechanism. So in the in the in the in your PowerPoint, you see a nice short video for two minutes that is talking about the indices. You also see a nice video that is less than six minutes that is talking about the global stock tech. So the globe, this global stock tech, we are saying at some point we need to ask what is it that we've done as the US, what is it that we've done as China to address the uh, the the provisions of the Paris Agreement, especially the indices or the net zero goal that, that has been put on the table. That's what you're going to look uh, into that. So then uh, the indices are uh, being central to the Paris Agreement. Um, they are aimed at keeping global average temperatures to at least less than 1.5 degrees. Now for those that understand uh, temperature, a point of a degree, 0.1 of a degree is, is a huge number. So we are saying that we need then to keep the world preferably to less than 1.5 degree Celsius pre-industrial level. So I think this is the level at which we can be comfortable as the world in terms of uh, extreme events. Now, does that mean if you go to two degrees, three degrees, the entire world is going to collapse? No. It means that continents like Africa are going to suffer heavily. It means developing countries that don't have um, the capacity that are vulnerable, they're going to suffer heavily. So then uh, 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 the indices become a key tool of measuring what each country is doing in terms of the climate change space or addressing the climate change space. The ultimate goal under this agreement, the Paris Agreement, is basically transition or transitioning the world to a low carbon economy and ultimately achieve a net zero growth. So by net zero, in a simple uh, way we are saying, we need actually the emissions we are emitting to be the same as the emissions we are removing through various uh, methods. I highlighted there what we need to achieve in COP2016, you're talking about, we need basically to scale up renewable energy uh, uh, technologies that have been proven, solar, wind. We also need to scale up energy efficiency. These actually have been proved. We need to scale up the uptake of electric vehicles. So these things will take us to net zero. Now, on the other hand, what do we need to do? We need to reduce the uptake of fossil fuels. We need to reduce coal. Actually, a lot of countries now, they are saying by 2030, developed countries, they won't be using coal. And actually, no more, I have I've read now, Standard Bank and other banks here in South Africa saying they are not going to be financing projects that involve coal. So we, we can see that uh, things have moved quicker than we expected. And I've always said in the past, uh, the net zero or, or the carbon neutrality is going to be a, 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 a you wake, to, wake up tomorrow and you discover the world has decided to go carbon neutral. Why? Because there have been multiple tipping points towards net zero that we've experienced in the past. If you are interested, go and retrieve a paper that I wrote around green growth is it signaling the death of the combustion engine? It was in 2014 when I wrote that article. And I always laugh because one journalist says, that Professor Namo, you've lost your mind. The combustion engine is here to stay. And I told him, because the world or humanity has had the capacity to do away with the steam engine, it still have that inherent capacity to do away with the combustion engine. And I always marvel when I hear these leaders saying what I said in 2014 to say, no, by 2025, we want, uh, like in UK, by 2030, I think, or 2035, they want maybe all, all their vehicles or national uh, bus systems to be on, 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 on uh, e-vehicles or hydrogen powered or on any renewable source of energy. So really the net zero a, a, a approach, the net zero outcome is here and is here to stay, which is then why we are putting this course in place to say the low carbon transition gen has started, it's going and it will be in the future. So as a continent, we don't want to be left behind because if you are left behind, it's going to be a problem in us trading with our partners, with our high, with our inherent high carbon content goods and services. Now, uh, so the Paris Agreement set that limit, like I said, on the uh, reduction of the uh, NDCs. And what is interesting is the NDCs 
they are supposed to be renewed, uh, revised after every five years. So the initial indices were the ones that, we, so there was actually the intended nationally determined contributions. So when the Pari Agreement was being formulated, countries had to put their intention to say, we are going to do ABCD under what we called intended nationally determined contributions. When the Pari Agreement was ratified, the countries also revised their intended nationally determined contributions into nationally determined contributions. Then those NDCs were the zero draft or the, the, the initial communication in 2015. Now, 2020, we have now the second round of the NDCs, which we now are saying they should show us a beyond reasonable doubt that the country, a country is committing, is fully committing to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions in earnest. So this is why there was noise here this week uh, regarding SASO, because the share, some of the shareholders, they were saying, no, SASO, we are trying to window dress. And when I was reading now, I saw billions uh, yesterday that were saying, now SASO is going to be genuine in terms of moving towards a, a low carbon pathway and net zero. And they've said to their shareholders, forget about your um, uh, uh, dividends for now, because a huge chunk of our budget, we are going to move towards rebranding our business to towards a, a net zero. And it's a reality. So again, in 2025, we'll see a revised NDCs. And of course, in 2030, we'll also see a revised NDCs. And these NDCs are trying to, to, check, to check us through to net zero uh, by 2050. So in between, there are global stock techs. So in 2023, there's going to be a global stock tech. 2028, we have another global stock tech in terms of what have we done, in terms of what we have uh, promised in the NDCs. Now, so of course, there will be different pathways in terms of these NDCs. I've already highlighted some of them to say they need to scale down uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the uh, uptake of, of fossil fuels. Then they need to scale up renewable energies, wind, solar, scale up uh, uptake of uh, 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 electric vehicles, and also scale up energy efficiency. These are some of the main uh, areas. And of course, there's also need for us to build resilience so that uh, our, our, our infrastructure then that we have put that uh, allows us to go towards net zero is uh, remains in, in intact. Now, we also deal with uh, extreme uh, weather uh, events uh, in, 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 in Africa. And uh, at the core of the quest to address carbon emissions is also the quest to avoid extreme uh, weather events or uh, mitigate, intervene uh, uh, in terms of extreme weather events. And we are saying that what are these extreme weather events that the continent is experiencing? We have tropical cyclones, we have extreme droughts, we have flooding, we have heat waves, we have desert storms, we have sea level rise, we have wildfires, we have extreme frost that affect our agriculture sector and many more. So we are saying all these are also linked, like I indicated earlier, to our low carbon journey. Why are these linked to our low carbon journey? They also require money. So the budget for us to be resilient, to build resilient African economies might be the same port. It could be from the same port where we are also getting money to build a low carbon transition. So that's the first, first point of contact. But um, uh, what would be interesting there is we also want to, you to have to have just a quick understanding of um, the, the, the mortality and economic losses from uh, weather extremes. There's a two minute clip that you can see from your PowerPoint and you can go by that. In this section, which we are concluding this module as well, we have uh, uh, tried to show, for, at least from a Southern Africa perspective, this part of the work we've just published this year. This is a book I did with uh, Chikodzi, David Chikodzi. And in this book, we were looking at um, a cyclone in Southern Africa, but a focus on the, uh, what happened in Zimbabwe, which was one of the, uh, uh, the epicenter of, of, of tropical cyclone in that. But we've got a Southern African map there that is indicating the pathway of uh, tropical cyclones uh, from Idai to Kenneth, 
Cyclone Fabio, Cyclone Elin, Dineo, Chalane, and Cyclone Elwes. There's also others that we might not have, have put in there. But what is uh, what is uh, uh, what can be seen? Then we have got the Mozambican Channel, Madagascar, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and partly South Africa, but mostly Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Madagascar and the Comoros. The, those islands they are actually on the pathway of cyclones. And you are saying that whatever happens in terms of the low carbon transition, we cannot do that outside the need to, uh, to address or to build resilience uh, uh, to tropical cyclones. Why? Uh, at some point we hear from a uh, uh, tropical cyclone that uh, the, the, uh, the transmission poles have gone down feeding South Africa. So we have got a, 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 a energy surges here. We are in Jack City in South Africa because Cyclone Idai had done what it, it did in Mozambique. Then in Zimbabwe, the same, we, we go to Chimani Mani and you discover settlements, uh, small hydro plants have been swept away. And all this is because of uh, uh, the failure to build a resilient infrastructure. So that uh, the issue of considering uh, extreme weather events, vulnerability, resilience in the context of low carbon e economy is exactly linked to the fact that resources will be needed either to rebuild energy resources, renewable energy resources, or uh, uh, smart, uh, smart cities if they have not been done properly, roads if they have not been done properly, other infrastructure if it has not been done properly. So I'm saying for us then to preserve the budgets, we need them to build resilience. And then that can give us the leeway to actually uh, move towards our low carbon transition. We've started in this presentation, you see them in the PowerPoint from, uh, from, the, uh, from our site of the course uh, on IDEP. Um, uh, one of the areas that actually was left uh, without any settlement, uh, that is a copper in Zimbabwe. And uh, we, we do a before and after scenario that you can see. And the reason why I'm floating this is you will see that even the energy infrastructure, like transformers, we've slotted in the, the wires, the transformers that were actually swept away during cyclone line. And we are saying that all these issues now, in terms of low carbon transition, we cannot exclude extreme weather events because it damages infrastructure and it also results in cost. We have also put uh, one of the uh, 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 scenarios there where there is a uh, 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 hydro, small hydropower. Uh, there's, there were, what was left behind was just a sign to say there was a, a, a Rusitu, a small hydropower. When we went to the site where that small hydropower was located, there was nothing, completely nothing during our field work. And these are some of the issues that we're saying are interesting. But of course, there was something that excited us during that field work in Zimbabwe in 2019. When we went to Chimani Mani, we visited a uh, Chimani Mani Road District uh, Clinic and we discovered the solar. Uh, solar panels and the hospital was intact, it was working. And that also rang a bell in terms of how do we, what do we mean by building climate resilient infrastructure? In the midst of that, actually less than uh, 50 meters, there are gullies that have been opened by the waters of cyclone, uh, tropical cyclone in Iran. But the solar that was on that roof of that uh, 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 district hospital uh, clinic is standing. And we are saying these are some of the lessons that we can learn to say we can still go a, a, a low carbon in that particular uh, context. Then we also slot work that we've done with uh, Professor Dube around um, the issue around uh, reducing rainfall and impact on tourism and uh, hydro, hydropower generation. Like we use an example of uh, Lake Kariba. We were saying that the water levels went down, especially in 2019, that the generation of power, which is actually low carbon power, uh, almost came to a standstill, especially the, 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 the south, uh, the south basin, yeah, the south basin, uh, the site for uh, the south bank, the site for Zimbabwe, because the water levels were so low, even also the northern bank uh, for Zambia, we could not generate as much electricity as we want. So therefore, the issue of extreme weather has a direct impact in terms of uh, where we want uh, uh, to be. 
So what should we uh, do now? We need to build adaptive capacity through integrated water resources management, improving community resilience and adaptive capacity. We need to address climate change health risk as well, investing in climate and weather services. This is critical. One of the major issues that we face when we did work around cyclone, tropical cyclone like uh, Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, is this fact that the, our meteorological offices are not equipped. In Zimbabwe, for example, they need a radar and they don't have that radar. So if you don't have a radar, what is that they estimate? They predicted, they forecasted 100 millimeters of rainfall in the next 24 hours. That was Zimbabwe. And what happened? We received a, uh, about 2,000 millimeters in the next 48 hours. That was a rainfall for two years, equivalent. Because in that area, the average rainfall in Chimani Mani or Eastern Highlands in Zimbabwe is about 1,100 millimeters per year. But we received rainfall close to 2,000 plus or minus 2,000 millimeters in 48 hours. This is why that was a massive disaster. And if, for example, that national um, uh, office, uh, meteorological office was equipped with radar and uh, with radars also located across the country, then they could have easily estimated the amount of rainbow rather than relying on old systems that only give us a maximum of 100 millimeters. In addition, we also need to revamp our community weather uh, stations. Not only that, the existing weather stations are not in a good state. And I always say to our government officials, it's never too late. With adaptation, we need as many weather stations, functional weather stations as we can. Other issues, at times we have challenges with manpower. There's one person manning a weather station. If the son is sick or the daughter is sick or there's a funeral, one month there are no records because there's no backup. All these are issues that we need to talk about as we talk about climate services. I think there's a whole course uh, under IDEP that's going to talk around that. I want to thank you because this way our second module ends. And I honestly hope you have enjoyed this brief recording and it will enhance your understanding as we move from the uh, 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 COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, the lessons we've learned about raising funds and how these can actually be useful in terms of raising funds for, for, for climate uh, mitigation net zero and also climate change, uh, building climate change uh, resilience. I thank you.